I know that the, uh, the title for the talk was like 5G for business, but that was for enticing people to come in to the talk after the, uh, after the break. Um, but it's going to be quite relevant. So what I'll be talking about is like edge computing and how we can leverage uh, edge computing and, and edge uh, networking, uh, actually. So I guess this is the thing. But I want to start with a, like a flashback going back to my first uh, to keynote back at the uh, first Open Daylight Summit. That was like five years ago where I had uh, actually uh, uh, putting on the future of data centers, that's like again five years ago, and I had uh, declared that data centers actually are almost dead, right? And that's because we cannot keep up the pace of building these data centers around the world, you know, because of you know, many, many issues, but mostly because of cost, but also there are some performance issues. And then uh, the, uh, the, the next slide, you know, uh, from that talk, again, it was like five years ago, was about you know, a fully distributed model where we move the intelligence processing and storage to the edge, as, as, uh, as you can see from that slide. And uh, as I said, that we need sort of like an out of the box uh, thinking back then. So what I, I, I'm gonna be introducing two concepts today. And the first one is uh, private edge uh, networks or, or uh, pens if you like. So a private edge network essentially is built on and utilizes edge uh, 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 resources, which are gonna be dedicated for that particular uh, as uh, networking, so you can think this is something that fits an enterprise essentially. And the, those resources, again, as we know from, from the ads uh, paradigm, are close to the, uh, to the user. It runs, of course, on a shared ads infrastructure, right? It's, not gonna, it's dedicated resources, but again, it's on a shared infrastructure. And you can have different use cases built uh, on, on that ads uh, 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 infrastructure. And uh, these uh, uh, private uh, edge networks can be flexible and extensible. So uh, they can span from the factory. If, if that's your definition of edge, and I know people are talking about what edge is, it doesn't really matter. It, it depends on what your specific use case is. And uh, so they can be something from the factory side, your, your plant, all the way to the central office and perhaps to the, uh, to the uh, uh, pop, to the uh, point of presence. And, um, if this is like a, a picture you know, of, the, uh, of an edge network, this is from Intel, they have a really great uh, depiction of uh, edge networking. You can see the different flavors of, uh, you know, of, of edge networks and what essentially um, uh, an edge network entice. And uh, you can see it can be the access, it can be the central office, or it could be the pop, and so forth. So when you're building these pants, again, you can be, as I said, anything from the uh, side to the central office or beyond. So it doesn't really matter. It would be up to the actual, to the, uh, to the customer, to the enterprise customer at this point to choose and, and, and decide what, how, you know, how they want to build that private ads uh, network. Uh, the second concept that I want to, uh, let me see, can go back. Uh, I thought there was another slide, but maybe, okay. Um, all right, okay. So the second uh, concept is the concept of the elastic edge. So we know that uh, about the elastic cloud, but obviously there's gonna be a need for the elastic edge. So here we're talking about dynamic application services that essentially would demand uh, on the fly deployment of resources. But also uh, kind of applications that they may want to move you know, from one side to another side and, and so forth in terms of content and workloads. And you can think like, you know, uh, uh, IoT is one a great example, smart transportation, ride sharing, if you look at the Lyfts and the Ubers of the world and so forth, autonomous vehicles, right, you know, um, any other ad hoc type of applications. Smart cities is a good example of how, you know, content and workloads might uh, need to move uh, uh, across your, uh, your ads. Other high bandwidth uh, applications such as, as AR, VR, and you know, 4K and 8K, and high definition in the future, and so forth. Uh, gaming, I think, is going to be a huge use case with uh, 4, 4, 5G. So if this is what sound that we have today. You know, we have the cloud and the edge, and the edge, as you can see, includes the uh, you know the the access side of the network, but also it may include uh, the actual devices. So if you look, at, if you talk to Amazon, you know, for them, the edge is the IoT devices, is what you have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in your office or, or in your home. So uh, when it comes to the, uh, um, you know, Elastic Edge, you know, looking at something like dynamic exchange, again, of content and workloads across the different uh, ads uh, sites. Um, so issues such as scalability, reliability, and agility, you know, uh, readability and high availability, you know, are, are going to be key to the elastic edge, and all that also includes uh, s uh, security, of course. It's, uh, it's fully distributed architecture has to has to be that way. 
um, and for the dynamic content uh, uh, delivery and so forth, and, and you know, to minimize, uh, again, delay. This is something that we already know from edge computing. And the other thing is the ephemeral deployment of uh, edge instances. Uh, you know, we can use the, you know, the, the name here, a slice, if you like, and choose the applications that you need uh, when and where you need them, actually, for, for this elastic type of, uh, of ads, and for how long, right? This is when you need them and, and for how long you're going to need those um, uh, slices or uh, ephemeral uh, instances of the, of the ads. Uh, there's going to be handoff and roaming between different edge nodes, and that's going to be, you know, very specific, of course, and relevant to the autonomous vehicles or to any of the autonomous um, uh, things. And you know, it could be drones, it could be other things, it could be robots, you know, uh, as well. So anything, you know, that, that moves from one side to another side, it is, becomes very relevant. And it has to be built. Uh, this and these are my own views. It has to be built on a very lightweight edge native VNFs, right? We have the cloud native VNFs, but we may need kind of like the edge native uh, VNFs. We know that 5G, because you know, of the high capacity that's gonna bring into the network, it will put some sort of like strains on the, on the, uh, on the network in terms of the, um, of the backhaul or the transport, if you like, and it would definitely require an elastic edge that you know, is in such state to the transition kind of like you know, from the mobile cloud to the, uh, to the edge. And uh, so when we start looking at these things, then you have to sort of uh, uh, look also how uh, automation and AI can, uh, you know, when it comes to like predictive, uh, 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 taking predictive actions and uh, uh, real time decision making uh, come into play. All right, so, um, so one instance of these private enterprise networks um, is, is gonna be like mo private mobile networks. And so, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about private LTE because this is relevant to what we have today in, in, in 4G. As you know, with 5G, things may change. Uh, and there's going to be you know, uh, private, essentially, 5G mobile networks. And this is something that I've been working on for about like a year now. And we built uh, a, actually a testbed in out of our office in, in San Francisco. And I will talk about that uh, in, a, in, in a minute. So, so a private LTE is nothing else but just like an LTE that is for the enterprise. Uh, it has you know, specific location coverage. It's not like a private, you know, public LTE. So it has specific uh, coverage and radius. So a, a good place to do like a private LTE would be a campus network. It could be a plant. It could be you know, a bunch of uh, buildings if you have. Like a hospital is another, another great, great uh, use case. It's exclusive use. It's only for that particular enterprise. So you can have like other people using that. And it's optimized and, and customizable for certain services and applications, uh, whatever you know you decide as a customer to uh, to deploy. And it's also managed locally, right? There's no uh, um, you know um, uh, uh, outside um, uh, entity that manages that that network. And it has the same characteristics of of a, of a public LT, but you can think it's like more like a small scale or, uh, type of uh, of uh, footprint. But you get the same same benefits as, as a public LTE. Um, so what really enables that private LTE uh, is like a couple of things in, in this uh, you know softwareization of the network or, or if you like or network virtualization. One component is visualizing the radio access network. Uh, that sort of like enables you know a, a, a private LTEs to, to become really accessible. And uh, you know, have the remote radio heads or remote radio, uh, radio units, if you like, and have a centralized pool of, of uh, base uh, baseband units will be used that's running on a server, instead of having like dedicated or bespoken equipment for, 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 uh, for, for the RAN as it's been traditionally. And uh, how you split the layer one to layer three functions, you know, for the, for, for the radio access network, it's up to, you know, the kind of implementation that you're doing. I've, I've seen different implementations from different vendors, so you can pick and choose what, which one you, you like uh, the most. And I have to tell you what really attracted me to edge computing a few years ago was that when I saw about, uh, you know, exposed to VRAN, I said, oh, you know, you can run that on a server, you know, the uh, BBU, I said, well, you know, and I was working on IoT at the same time. So that's interesting because I can take all my IoT traffic and do the analytics and the filtering at the very edge of the network. And then, you know, all the processing, I don't have to send all that data to the, uh, to the cloud. And the second component, uh, because it's all about LT, of course, is, is the Visual uh, Evolved Packet Core, the VPC. The VPC has been one of the great uh, use cases uh, for, for NFV when we started NFV back in 2013. 
that's the one that really uh, came up. And the second one was the virtualizing the CP, which has actually led to the universal CP that um, uh, uh, there was a talk, a talk uh, before. And uh, when it comes to the, to the um, virtualizing Evolve Packet Core, you know, in, in a traditional way, you had all these different um, elements, the MMEs, the SSS, the, you know, the, uh, the P gateways and S gateways. This is like, you know, typical hardware that you'd go from and buy from a vendor, whether it's Ericsson or Nokia, like at Lucent or Huawei back in the day. And uh, we were working early on with a startup called uh, Connectum that actually was acquired by Brocade and then it was sold off to uh, Mavenir. And uh, they had a different type of model, how they can build this uh, VPC, kind of like you know, diverting from the traditional model of building like these uh, silo boxes for your elements. They just broken down into, uh, into functions within that box. And, what, and, and everything is done in software. And that, what allowed them for, to do is that, for instance, if you get, you like, you know, uh, if you're like running an event and you have you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of those uh, of, the, of users and, and UEs, uh, user equipment, then you could actually easily scale up one of these functions, right? You just need to, you know, run the same function in additional uh, uh, servers or additional VMs or, or containers, whatever you like. So it was easily, you could easily scale up and out that uh, virtual EPC. And I think this is like, I mean, this is one of the uh, uh, consequences of, you know, when you start looking at disaggregating your hardware, you know, that kind of architectures that you can get. It's very, if you think about it, it's almost a very, very cloud native, uh, 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 network functions, if you like. So uh, people may have, you know, ask if, you, if you're doing a primary LTE, you know, how what what happens with a spectrum. So there's like a few choices there. So private LTE can operate in, in a in a license or unlicensed spectrum. So if you have a service provider, for instance, in the U.S., could be AT&T or Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile, they own spectrum, as you know. And if they were like run to something like that, they would just allocate you know, a band to uh, that particular customer. Of course, you have to make sure that you don't interfere with the public, public LTE. But it can also work in a licensed space. And, and there's a lot of talk about CBRS, the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, which operates at 3.5 uh, gigahertz. And this is like a spectrum that has been uh, released. And uh, it could be also LTE uh, unlicensed uh, uh, space. And there's something called uh, Multifier which is at five, uh, five years. So there are a lot of different options out there. So the idea when you look at private LTE is that, you know, to boost data speeds for very short distances, right? As I said, you probably want to go for a couple of, of miles, maybe three miles uh, when you're doing this private LTE. And uh, uh, people may ask, okay, if I, if I have a user, uh, if I have my mobile phone, right? I mean, if I'm using that for private LTE, can I still use that for my, you know, normal, uh, 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 communications needs, right, with my, uh, my, my service provider, whether it's AT&T or Verizon, whomever, you know, over the public LTE. And uh, today you cannot do that because you have a SIM card, you know, that SIM card is provisioned for that private LTE. But with eSIM, which is the embedded SIM that is coming up, uh, I know that Apple supports one of these in, in one of their latest uh, uh, phones. Uh, eSIM, I think, is going to be a game changer when it comes to you know, facilitating the private LTE, how you can do the remote provisioning and, and so forth. And it's also going to be great for uh, IoT devices as well because you can, you know, again, provision those IoT devices uh, remotely. Um, let me see here. Okay. Um, so what are the use cases as far as LTE is, is, is concerned? You know, as I said, it's, it's great for the enterprise. Uh, it's a, a, an ad hoc turnkey type of solution. Deployment options it can be a campus network, could be a multi tenant building, could be extended public facilities. We've seen, or we've actually heard, I've seen uh, deployments uh, for ports and airports. Um, and I'll explain later on why that uh, is so appealing. Uh, remote sites, you have like oil platforms out in the ocean, you know, then the, the kind of like spectrum interference becomes less of a problem. Um, and cruise ships, if you think about it, you know, uh, airplanes and autonomous things, anything from drones to robots to, to vehicles and so forth. And it's a great fit for IET, and that's how we got started actually. Uh, we're playing with private LTE. And uh, it's easy also to, once you start like, you know, softwareizing and virtualizing the network, um, 
then you can also start thinking about how you can run other software-based solutions, right, on, on top of that. And it could be something for AI and machine learning. It could be, you know, for particular metrics, for instance. It could be diagnostics that runs in software. Uh, traffic offloading is one actually of the, one of the early uh, SDN cases that I personally worked on. Uh, but that was almost like you know nine years ago. How you can offload traffic from a 4G network to Wi-Fi and sometimes vice versa. So network slicing and private LTE. So if you, you can add slicing to private LTE to, to create you know these customized networks. So there's, when you talk about network slicing in in the uh, uh, in, in the in the uh, in 5G um, is is like two things. One or, or or 4G for that matter. It's like the run slicing uh, side of things where you know you didn't not, just, uh, need to partition the radio resources. And there's also the slicing from the mobile core side, where you just essentially need to segregate uh, mobile traffic. Uh, one of the things that really attracted our attention is how you can do slicing in a very dynamic way. Uh, so you can act, allocate slice on the fly and on demand. You can you know, use some calendaring. You, know, you can say, you know, I want to have like that particular slice up from 8 AM to 5 PM, for instance. Um, you have like elastic bandwidth, and I'll, I'll go over when I talk about the test that we have in our, um, in our lab in, in San Francisco, and also how you can do a dynamic slice selection where you can put users on different slices depending on their profiles or, you know, and so forth. So there are a number of options that you can start uh, working on. So a slice can have its own policies and resources and functions. It's something that we, uh, we know. Uh, you can have context-aware slices, right? You can have one which is just for CDN, for instance. You know, that's one of the early use case work on slicing, how you can do uh, essentially multicasting. Um, you can have, you know, your Facebook traffic on a slice. You can, it can be anything, right? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, it could be medical applications and so forth. And uh, an example here is that we worked on is the, um, I should go back here, it's like different slides for different IoT applications, if you, if you like, right? Um, Okay, and we know that slide, uh, the network slice is actually baked into the 5G standard, and, and that's really coming up. I'll probably skip the run slide. You're going to get a copy of the slides, um, so it gives you a you know, more details how run slicing happens. Of course, what is always on our minds is how you can achieve this end-to-end -end slicing that everybody's talking about. So you have the run slicing, you have the, the mobile core slicing on, 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 you know, on, on the other. And, and you need some sort of like glue, you know, between uh, between the two. And sometimes you may also want to connect to a public uh, uh, LTE network for mobility and additional services, as I said before, for calling and, and so forth. So stitching those, you know, slices, uh, you know, that might exist in, in um, geographic disparate uh, private LTE, you know, uh, that's also going to be another interesting thing to look at and create sort of like a unified uh, operation across, like uh, if you have a like ride-sharing company, right? Like Lyft or Uber, they operate different parts of the of the world or different parts of the country. They can create these private LTE networks and and sit them together if you like. Uh, I'm going to skip these. I'm, I'm going to show that you know 5G. What kind of benefits we get with 5G is mostly about you know low latency, of course, and how the mul um, multitude of of, of uh, capacity. Uh, whether it's like one cell or multiple cells or you know uh, multiple devices, and um, so that's where we are today. The, today is the uh, have the NSA type of deployment uh, mode where the, the 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 control plane is is using still the existing uh, LTE, and that will all change in the future. Um, so like as you know, trials already happening in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Uh, the, the one thing that really I mean, did come up in, in early discussions here is that now you have, like, you know, these small cells, you know, the, the radius that they operate is, 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 is uh, decreased, is reduced uh, considerably. So you're going to need a lot of these small cells, right? And typically that might lead to higher costs. Uh, the good news is that these small uh, uh, inode bees or antennas, they cost, you know, uh, are relatively inexpensive. And this is a picture from our uh, Orange Labs in uh, back in, the, uh, in, in France, in Paris, and uh, you can see this is like the 4G antenna, and this is the, we're doing some trials, and this is the 5G antenna, pretty, pretty small footprint, and uh, it costs much, much less than the uh, uh, 4G equivalent. And uh, we actually, we did a, a paper for this magazine that we, with other uh, colleagues, that we talk about, you know, how you can do uh, orchestration and, 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 and 5G slicing, and what it will entail in terms of, uh, of course, in case you want to 
know a little bit more about um, you know how this is going to be happening. All right. Um, so what are the business applications as far as private LD is concerned? So uh, as I mentioned, that the solarization of different uh, components it has you know make makes private LD very very possible at a very low cost uh, in terms of hardware. Um, and um, you know, it can enable a really high capacity in low, for low delay applications such as AR, VR, and some that we're looking at, robotics and, and imaging, if you like. Uh, it provides universal connectivity, and this is very important to emphasize here. You just need one antenna, you can get coverage for a radius of two or three miles, depending on, on you know, kind of uh, signal you have and how you can control that. It's very scalable, so you know, if you need to add users, you, know, you can do that easily. Um, and it's really, really easy and fast to, to install and deploy. And actually, I did uh, a private LT demo um, a month ago, I believe, at Intel. I, I put everything in a box. I, I you know, uh, transport everything from our, from our office in San Francisco, and we set it up. In, it took like you know just a few minutes to set it up. So it's very, very easy to install and deploy. Um, and again, it's one. The important thing here is like one is one a wireless network to manage. And I'll come back to that, uh, uh, you know, later on. Uh, it's very hardware agnostic. We have uh, experimented with different uh, vendors for the uh, for the hardware, for the uh, for the inode B of side, and you know that you know you should be able to support uh, uh, interoperability. That that shouldn't be a problem. So you can have multiple vendors. So that's that's really the good news. Um, and uh, you know it could be also become part of an SD WAN uh, solution for for people if they if they decide so. Okay, so. Um, so here's, here's another thing. It's been my vision when I start looking at private LT that maybe that can, could replace totally Wi-Fi uh, sometime in, in, in the future, right? And again, it's a single uh, you know, basis can replace the, uh, a few Wi-Fi access points. And actually, uh, I was talking to uh, someone who um, uh, uh, he's responsible for, uh, for uh, uh, the largest port in, in the US, and they, they, they decided to, instead of like installing Wi-Fi and you know, multiple access points, they just they decided to do a private LTE. It provides complete coverage and, and no need to you know, manage and install these access points and so forth. Uh, it provides quality of uh, service support because you know, that's what slicing and non-slicing uh, does, actually. So as we know, Wi-Fi really sucks when it comes to quality of service. Again, it's one single pane of management and visibility, enhanced security, because you manage that. You, you, know, you don't allow others to play with your Wi-Fi and so forth. If you want to create different network IDs, you use slicing. It's pretty simple. Um, it does support uh, voice over LTE. And it eliminates any kind of provision complex that, that, you know, that Wi-Fi, as we know, entails. So that's really great for, for IoT. Uh, and this is so sort of like, you know, the kind of, as I mentioned, we've been working on private LT for uh, a year and a year and a half right now. It's like an LT in a box, how we call it. And our test but essentially consists of uh, a couple of Intel NUCs, uh, uh, inode Bs from Acceleron and Cavium, so we played with uh, both. We have a VPC from uh, Quartus, it's a company out of the UK, and we're looking into uh, this um, open source um, uh, virtual EPC from uh, Sprint and Intel once it gets a little bit more stable. Uh, and you're also using uh, Netsias, um, which is a, a startup out here in, in, uh, in the Bay Area, for the run, sli uh, run slicing uh, component. Um, and this is the so like the architecture, if you like, of our test bed. And since we start also to see how we can support IoT, you know, so we created different slices for also including one for, for IoT. And uh, the, the actual use case that we focused for that one was like a, a hospital private LTE. So you can see that we can allocate slices for, for different uh, um, applications or, or different uses within the hospital. So you get the staff gets one slice, and that again refers to run slicing. Then you have the patients, you know, the visitors getting another slice, and then you can also have IoT because you have you know, medical devices. Um, so you can assign different slices. And the thing about that, and that's what uh, Netsia's software comes in, is that it provides a very dynamic uh, way to do your slicing. So if there's like something like an emergency, let's say there's an earthquake, right? And all of a sudden you're getting uh, casualties coming into your hospital, you may want to assign more capacity, more bandwidth to the staff. You can actually do that you know, with a push of a button on your iPad. I mean, this is, this is an actual demo that, uh, that we can do. Um, or if you want to deploy something like there was like uh, you know the the 
hurricane thing uh, in Puerto Rico, right? A couple of years ago, right? If you want, and all the infrastructure was, was, you know, most of the infrastructure was, was destroyed. You can just, you know, uh, drop a private LTE and you can provide coverage uh, almost instantly uh, for, for, that, for that area. So, um, and this is the actual, you know, uh, and this is actually, the, that's the private LTE, that the, whatever you see on the picture there, uh, you know, you can see the, you know, the white box on, on your right, that's the one from Acceleron. You know, the Acceleron box costs less than $1,000, and the Nooks, as you know, is like uh, about $500. So in terms of hardware, you don't need more than $2,000 to set it up, and then uh, you just need to add that the, the software. The software is the most expensive part of the whole uh, um, setup here. All right, uh, I have a few closing thoughts here. So if you don't live on the ads, you take too much space. And, uh, uh, but then you never see the view. But it's, I mean, you know, it's been on the news lately and it's not like something that we should joke about, uh, but be cautious. Oops. Um, okay, let's just, no, you have to make sure you don't say too close or otherwise see what happens. Okay, that's all I got. Um, do we have uh, time for questions one and two, maybe? Yes, uh, anybody else other than Alan? Is there a question or is there a comment? Question. Okay, good. All right, go ahead, Alan. <laughs> I, I don't think I've really made any comments. I've given some introductions, but I know that a question has a question mark. My rabbi taught me that. <laughs> In any event, uh, I'm a big fan of LTE, especially with respect to Wi-Fi and even 802.11ax Wi-Fi 6. But I know on the last earnings call that at and CEO and CFO are mentioning private 5G as the new LAN for the enterprise. Right. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So, so when which, I which seems which seems quite premature. Maybe. It is pretty much true because 5G is not here yet, right? So, uh, but I think if you, yeah. if you read it on my IEEE tech blog. Right. So, but, and this is my own personal views, right? And we know that's going to happen, you know, but we know that the, 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 definitely the costs are there uh, in terms of deployment. We purpose, uh, you know, it's going to be in certain use cases, maybe in, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in high, high, highly dense uh, areas, uh, in downtowns of uh, big cities, if you like. And, uh, but, um, you might see also private LTE, you might see also uh, uh, things, uh, small cells being deployed in private buildings as well. So that can help a little bit about the, about the coverage. But I, I think what's going to drive, and we had this discussion you know, during the break, of course, is that what was going to drive 5G initially, I think, is going to be business. And it, to me, even when I started working on IoT, I focused on the enterprise use case because you know, that's what's really going to drive the business, right? Because uh, if you look at the consumer, the, the price you know, uh, yeah, point is not there yet. It's going to be super. about that before, but to me, LG, private LTE is a solution today. You don't really need private Yeah, so it is a solution today. Right, as, as I mentioned, and we, I, I, we know we've seen like uh, airports and ports here in the US and they are already doing that. Um, and, uh, but I think that, and, and this has kind of been my message here, that I personally I think that this might, I don't know whether it's going to explode, but it's going to, uh, you know, take off with the, uh, you know, with the uh, launch of 5G because people are like, oh, you know, I can get, you know, this high, high speeds. You don't have to worry about fiber or, or ethernet. You know, to, uh, for, for your office, you can just, you know, do that. Um, so I, th I think that's my personal, again, it's not like an orange uh, uh, view or, or, or announcement or... Um, so you're skeptical like me? I mean, you always have to be skeptical, right? Yeah, I, like to, I like to see things happen before, I, you know, I can preach about things, right? But, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know whether it can happen. So that's, that's the vision. That's where I think, you know, things might go. But, you know, as I said, you know, always have to be, you know, kind of like skeptical, you know, what's going to take. I mean, it might be, you know, the kind of like, what if like something like another, the next Uber comes up, right? It says, you know, 5G is going to be great and they launch like some other type of application that, you know, that's going to be great. So we don't know what's going to happen. Sorry, Any I'm other you had a question. We'll take one burning more. questions? Actually, I'll ask him offline. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you, Christoph.